Hello and welcome to News Click. Today we have with us Professor Satyajit Rath from National Institute of Immunology and Dr. Amit Sen Gupta from the All India People Science Network. Today we'll discuss the Lancet Infectious Diseases article which claims there has been large scale resistance to antibiotics in New Delhi. And this is shown by the samples they have taken here. This is the Lancet report which you can see. And the samples that have been taken, the samples have been taken from various places of Delhi as you can see, which show where the antibacterial resistance has been found. The report summarizes basic information that out of the 50 drinking water samples, two have been found contaminated with such bacteria. A large number of samples taken from sewage and other discharges seem to show, again, similar bacterial strains are there. And even virulent strains to Shigella and cholera have been affected. So what do you make of all this, Satyajit? In the first place, let us uh, understand something. Once you have an antibiotic resistance gene um, and BLA NDM1 or NDM1 is an antibiotic resistance gene that codes for a protein, an enzyme that breaks a certain category of antibiotics down. Once you have this on a piece of DNA that can be exchanged between bacteria, what we are really looking for is an antibiotic resistance genetic element that can be relatively freely exchanged between a number of bacterial species and strains. Having had it identified from patient populations, ostensibly or otherwise from Delhi, it's not particularly surprising that it's fairly widespread. And um, since Amit is here, I suspect that we are going to get into the issue of how antibiotic resistance has been generated in India and the public health policies that are involved with this. But technically, there are interesting things. In the first place, what we are being told is that there are seepage samples. I am not quite sure what seepage samples are. Seepage samples, both stationary water samples and rivulets, is what the Lancet Infectious Disease article says. So one has the uncomfortable suspicion that this is leaking sewage. A fair proportion of the seepage samples, about a third of them uh, or so, uh, show the presence of this resistance gene. Clearly, it's widespread. There's a very interesting point which Amit, I'd like you to come in. Uh, the government of India agencies seem to have claimed that the samples should not have been taken out of the country because they violate biohazard rules. Now, what they're really saying is taking tap water out of the country violates biohazard rules? Tap water and sewage water. Uh, which means that the government has al already agreed that there is a biohazard in the drinking water in Delhi, which I think is a very serious admission. But uh, more seriously, I think we need to have a sort of uh, more balanced perspective on this. The reaction of the Indian government uh, and the ICMR and various other associated people is largely to say that this is an attack in, against the Indian health system. Now, I have a serious objection to calling what is basically medical tourism because if you remember the earlier paper, it essentially looked at institutions and hospitals that are involved in me medical tourism. Now, calling high-end corporate hospitals and medical tourism as the Indian health system. Now, it is nothing like the Indian health system. So what you have in India is actually a conjuncture of two things, an almost total breakdown of the public health system and superimposed on that you have high tech corporate led hospitals catering to the Indian elite and people coming from outside to get treatment. So you have conditions where you have a poor public health system that does not catch infectious diseases when they should be in a large majority of the population. And you have the conditions where the latest antibiotics will be used in a certain section. And that is a lethal combination. And uh, I am not surprised that uh, India has been shown to be, I mean we can keep on debating whether it came from India or not. But India at least has been shown to be one of the places where an 
serious antibiotic resistance strain has arisen. Now, we do know we have data on this the data may still be debatable about uh, how, uh, how much India is actually involved. But you have data for example, that uh, drug resistant tuberculosis we have by far the highest number of cases again because of similar reasons. So, it is essentially what we need to focus upon rather than this very knee jerk Swadeshi kind of a reaction that a lot of people have is the fact that we have a dysfunctional health system. So, so let me let me yeah, disagree I, with Amit a little bit here. Okay. Let me make an argument about the government's response. In the first place, this is a report about antibiotic resistance gene in drinking water and sewage. So, it is no longer an issue of medical tourism. And if I were the government, I would say certainly when we object to this, we are not objecting on behalf of medical tourism, we are objecting on behalf of the public health system. Now, we one could ostensibly say that if you have a problem, why are you not admitting and solving the problem instead of denying it. However, for the government, the government will say panic is a major issue and therefore, we have to argue that this is not as grievous and as serious a matter as the paper makes it out to be. Do you not think that that is a no, reasonable I, I argument? That is that's part of the story. If you look at it, the way the story was actually broke and the way it was orchestrated in a number of media publications, there was this whole angle of this being a conspiracy against the medical tourism industry. Which they will call of course, the medical industry. <laughs> Which they call the medical industry. So, there is definitely an angle of medical tourism, uh, which the government by going along with this kind of a position is part of uh, sort of forwarding that position. The other point is that this is a resistance against carbapenem. Now, it is a very expensive antibiotic and though we know that antibiotic misuse is rampant in the country, but largely these are used in hospital settings and especially in hospital settings where people can pay that kind of money to afford these antibiotics. So, I would still go along with uh, the argument that largely this has been brought along. You cannot of course, isolate a portion of your country from the rest of it. So, there would be cross transmission, but largely this is a problem that has been brought about not just in medical tourism uh, hospitals, but in large corporate hospitals who misuse expensive man antibiotics. The two issues over here, assuming that it originated from this loci. Nevertheless, the fact is it has gone into now widespread uh, water, drinking water, sewage in a, in, a, in a large area. And presumably this would be repeated in other places in India as well. The question that comes up A for common man like me, how dangerous is it? We are calling it the super bug. We really have pictures of Ebola and virulent you know, infections and so on. But this does not seem to be, in, in spite of the widespread prevalence, does not seem to have caused a very large number of deaths. So, what does this super bug really mean? Well, the notion of a super bug and I am sort of uh, overtaken by a sense of deja vu, but nonetheless, the notion of a super bug for all of us um, is something that kills something that is dangerous, something that is difficult to deal with. Um, the methicillin resistant Staphylococcus aureus for example, popularly called the flesh eating bacteria, MRSA, MRSA, whatever uh, is thought of as a potentially lethal serious infection as an example of an antibiotic resistant superbug. Um, but consider this report that we are looking at. It has been found in Vibrio cholerae, which is the cholera bug. Now, we have government uh, denials notwithstanding, uh, we certainly have cholera in the country. Um, how much cholera we have in the country is open to debate and perhaps the government will invoke uh, uh, rules similar to the ones they have invoked uh, in this case uh, to prevent too much of that conversation. How does one treat cholera? And we have known 
for a very long time through research done in the third world, including in India, that the best way of treating cholera and avoiding death is give oral rehydration solutions. And we've had research that has come up with the optimal uh, composition of oral rehydration solutions. The oral rehydration solution doesn't even involve an antibiotic. All you do to a patient of cholera is provide sufficient oral rehydration solution for the patient to throw the cholera bug out because cholera is a self-limiting infection by and large. This doesn't mean that antibiotics are not given to patients of cholera. They are, but they are not the primary critical mainstay of treatment. So in this situation, somebody explained to me why I should be terrified more of an NDM1 carrying Vibrio cholerae than of an NDM1 free Vibrio cholerae. No, obviously this is not a super bug per se. I mean, that itself is a misnomer because we are not talking about a bug. We are not talking about a bacteria. We are talking about a gene sequence which has the ability to now move from one bacteria to the other. And, and so we can't say, we can't compare it, it with the MRSA, which is a specific Staph aureus uh, bacteria. So that in itself means that there is the potential, we still do not have the evidence, but there is the potential that this genetic sequence can latch itself onto a bacteria which causes serious infections, which is a virulent infection. And then you are left with not too many choices about how to treat that. So there is this potential uh, sort of danger uh, that this uh, uh, gene has that we, we have to recognize. But on the other hand, we also have to understand that if a bacteria has this gene, it will be resistance to one class of antibiotics, carbapenems. It is one of the latest antibiotics which is used for very serious infections where most other antibiotics do not work. But that does not mean that other antibiotics will not work on it. This is specific to one class of antibiotics. So, we, we need to sort of have everything in a certain perspective and be clear about what we are uh, really talking about. But again, not, let us not sort of underplay the seriousness of what can happen potentially. What do you think should have been the response of the system given the fact that we do not seem to have collected this kind of samples, we do not seem to be monitoring what is happening in the country, apart from the NDM1, I am sure there are other issues also. So does not this show a certain lack of understanding or a certain lack of response of the system which should be there in any case? This is very difficult to talk about the response of a system when the system does not exist. Unfortunately, we do not have a system of surveillance and virtually. We may have uh, an apology uh, of a surveillance system. Uh, so, if you have a serious problem with a rogue bacteria that is running amok, there is nothing that your system can do because you cannot put in place a system after a situation such as this arises. But in the long term, of course, what it essentially means is that you have to invest much more on public health. India is a basket case. It is one of the lowest spenders, last five in the global scale in terms of what we spend on public health. Per capita? Uh, both in terms of percent GDP as well as in terms of uh, the percent of uh, public to private expenditure. India and Pakistan in, incidentally are the, among the last five. So, in many ways we are very similar. So, now that is what we need to really address rather than sort of knee-jerk jingoistic reactions. Now, there may be a, a racial or a colonial tinge to why New Delhi was uh, really singled out as, as a name for the, uh, for the gene sequence. But for me, that is trivial. What is much more important is that this points to the total and utter failure of one, the public health system and two, our ability to regulate private practice which today is 80% 80 per, 80 of medical care in the country. It is interesting what you raised earlier that a lot of this is originated it seems from really the medical tourism hospitals or the special speciality hospitals as they are called which use quite a bit of antibiotics perhaps not even 
uh, necessary to the case. Do you think that there is a problem in the specifically in this kind of hospital? No, there is no perhaps to it. The way we use antibiotics in general practice as well as in specialist practice, you don't do that anywhere in the world. There is now this trend of pharmaceutical corporations being tied to many of these corporations which are running hospitals. You have Ranbaxy uh, with Fortis. You have Zydus which has, which has invested in Apollo. You have Panacea which is now uh, starting a new super specialty hospital in uh, Gurgaon. You have Max which is part of the, uh, been part of the Ranbaxy uh, family. You have Wokhart, a pharmaceutical company with, with the same name starting a hospital chain. Now, there is an obvious conflict of interest here. Now, Ranbaxy, Zydus, Wokhart, all these three companies which also have an interest in corporate hospitals involved in medical tourism have their own brands of meropenem, which is the drug to which resistance has been shown uh, through this gene. So, there is a connection that we need to explore. We do not have evidence and without evidence we cannot say for sure, but that is something that is definitely striking. Satyajit, well, what do you think is the solution to some of these issues that are coming well, up? Think about it this way. Carrying on from where Amit left off, it is possible to argue that on the one hand, in the public interest, we need an antibiotic usage policy. On the other hand, from the pharmaceutical company's point of view, it is to their advantage for the present situation to continue. Because the first thing that would happen if antibiotic usage were stringently regulated, if for example, the nominal formal rule that without a formal prescription antibiotics are not to be sold, were actually to be implemented, antibiotic sales will fall. Clearly, it is to the interests of pharmaceutical companies to continue the present extremely anarchic situation of antibiotic sale over the counter to continue despite its obvious ill effects. One can think about that as a kind of sort of conspiracy. More correctly, one should recognize that as the obvious self, as the obvious self interest of uh, um, profit sector uh, um, pharmaceutical companies and take that into account when we are making policy. The problem is who will make policy? Perhaps we should go back to the map. And if you look at that map carefully, you suddenly realize, so this is a map where all the green spots are seepage samples that are positive for NDM1. And you will realize that neither political nor diplomatic Delhi shows any evidence of this. The core of Lutiensis Delhi is remarkably NDM1 free. It speaks for itself. Now, there are two possible, in the best scientific tradition, there are two possible explanations. One is that Tolman and their colleagues, Walsh Tolman and their colleagues, did not either dare to sample within the heart of Lutiensis Delhi or were not permitted to sample from the heart of Lutiensis Delhi or from Chanakipuri or two, that they did sample since we do not know what the distribution of the sampling is. These are only the positives. They did sample and they did not find any. Now, there is a third explanation that uh, it is in Lutians Delhi that you, you do not see seepage taking place through the sewerage system. Correct. It is in the other places that, that you are actually in other seeing words, it. The political class which will make policy lives in protected enclaves. <laughs> yes. Such extremely carefully protected water supply is provided to the policy makers that perhaps they are not exposed to the bacteria, the antibiotic resistance and the risks for which they are supposed to be making policy. Except for the fact that it is really not possible in the long run to protect any, any set of people from bacteria and plague, other diseases take place. They have typically also taken down the ruling classes with it.
<laughs> so I think we this has been a very interesting discussion and I think the controversy is going to continue also on NDM1 and of course on the health policies of, the, of this. So we'll continue to discuss with you Absolutely. implications of this. Thank you. Thank you.